Yes. Okay, so uh, good morning. You're a girl, uh, Kivanov. Uh, don't be afraid. I'm not going to torture you uh, with my Hungarian. It's really basic. I know just few words. So uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Adam Balzer. I work uh, in uh, various Polish uh, institutions, including uh, Visa Europa. Uh, that's a Polish uh, acronym. Visa, Warsaw Institute of uh, Economic slash uh, European Studies. Europa is, of course, European, uh, Polish. Of course, it sounds very nice in English, wise, Europe. And uh, uh, we are, I'm a, a senior fellow at uh, Visa. And uh, of course, I'm responsible for the content of uh, the project, uh, uh, which uh, is called you, you Skeptic Ops. That's again uh, an acronym. Analyzing your skepticism, informing citizens, and encouraging debates. And that's the project uh, which um, is uh, implemented uh, within the framework of uh, uh, the EU program Europe for Citizens. Uh, and it's, of course, co funded by the European Commission. And uh, we are meeting today online, but in fact, mostly in uh, Budapest. That's why I started. Uh, Hungarian, because uh, we are leaders of this project with Europa. We have partners, I will present them later on, um, uh, with whom we establish uh, our consortium. Uh, consortium. And uh, of course, uh, today we are meeting um, during online seminar, uh, under which is under the title uh, Euroscepticism in the Heart of Europe. And uh, of course, um, uh, mostly we would like to uh, discuss today uh, the problems, uh, and it's a really an euphemism with the rule of law. And here, of course, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Hungary is the worst case scenario of these negative trends uh, regarding Eurosceptic uh, political forces that uh, uh, very often, also in my country, as you know, we have the ruling party law and justice. They talk a lot about uh, fight against corruption, against corrupted judges and so on. But at the same time, of course, what they are doing, they are undermining the rule of law, dismantling the rule of law. And in fact, Hungary is a very, unfortunately, sad example of that uh, trend, uh, because uh, what happened uh, in uh, Hungary is, in fact, uh, a uh, very huge uh, increase of corruption under Viktor Orban and uh, currently, according to the Transparency International, Hungary together with Bulgaria is uh, uh, the most corrupted country in the European Union, is on the second place just behind Bulgaria. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that pretty soon will surpass Bulgaria and this is a very sad um, uh, phenomenon. And uh, that's something unprecedented in the history of the European Union. And of course, it is very strongly correlated with uh, even uh, more sad um, uh, trend, uh, namely uh, this uh, um, democratic uh, backslide uh, uh, of Hungary and Hungary uh, uh, was relegated to the category of partly free countries uh, four years ago. And that uh, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the only country in the European Union, but nevertheless, you can hear quite open politicians from Eurosceptic parties saying, we would like to have Budapest in Warsaw, in Rome, and so on. And we would like to catch up with uh, Hungary, unfortunately. So uh, that's a little bit sad picture, but nevertheless, we have to face reality. And we will start with uh, uh, our host, is our uh, uh, Hungarian colleagues, uh, partners from Political Capital, and I will give the floor uh, uh, to Rudolf Berkes, uh, who will tell you a little bit uh, about the project and so on, and then I will present uh, um, uh, our uh, web page. So, uh, Rudolf, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. I am Rudolf Berkes, I'm an analyst at Political Capital, and I am tasked with um, coordinating these projects from the side of our organization, and um, and I would like to uh, say a few words about um, this project overall. As Adam mentioned, this is um, this project is being done in an international consortium with multiple partners from all around of Europe, with the support of the European Union, and um, 
um, this, uh, this project aims, first of all, to understand and uh, examine and um, after that monitor the, the movements of eurosceptic parties and eurosceptic movements in, uh, in Europe. And um, in order to do that, first, we conducted um, together with all our partner organizations um, uh, background research in these parties from all around of Europe. And um, we are building, and I think we are finished building a, a web page to, to show the world these parties and how they moved in recent years and how, and this way researchers and journalists and um, other interested parties could monitor the movement of these parties in the future. So we are very happy to announce this web page. And uh, after this, in every um, partner country, we, we conduct and con or conducted um, a so-called citizens workshop in order to discuss these issues um, in its depth with, um, with citizens interested in the topic with a wide range of um, age and uh, demographics and, um, and other attributes to be a more diverse group. And I think in the last two events in, in Trieste in Italy, which was organized by ADA and here in Budapest organized by us and Demnet actually yesterday, we think we managed that and not only just to discuss these issues, but to provide some solutions to the, to, to civil society, to national leaders, to, to even EU um, decision makers, and most of all to ourselves and how we can um, reimagine uh, the European Union and how we can restore the faith in the European project overall. And, um, and, um, and yes, what are the main um, obstacles to achieve these? What are the main issues with the EU? We, these topics have been discussed in depth, um, yesterday and the, and the event in Trieste, and it will be discussed in, in other events during this project in other partner countries as well. The next uh, upcoming event is, I think, will be in Mamu by Mamu University uh, and, um, and next Brussels and Warsaw, I believe. And, um, and other than that, this event, this public um, event is our expert discussion and about the topic and which will finalize the events in, uh, in Hungary and, um, and um, close the project from our side. And we, once we, are, uh, we gathered the recommendations from, from citizens and the recommendations from experts, um, we will be able to, to, to connect these recommendations at the closing event in Warsaw with the organization of Wise Europa or project leader, and um, we will create a citizen's manifesto and, then, and uh, channel it uh, to decision makers all around Europe. And, um, and uh, I would like to um, give back Adam, give, the, give back the floor to Adam and his colleagues to show us our, show us the special web page we have created or they have created to be frank. Um, Adam, are you ready to show us the web page? Uh, in fact, I'm sorry uh, because uh, mm, my colleague was supposed to do that because, uh, sorry, uh, I'm not very good in these technical things. Unfortunately, uh, let's give her a few minutes. Okay. Uh, uh, I will start. In fact, I wanted to, to say a few words about our consortium, our partners, and the idea of the project. I will elaborate a little bit sure. on uh, uh, what you have already said. So first of all, um, be, uh, besides Political Capital and the University of Malmo, which uh, uh, both of them have been already mentioned uh, by Rudolf, uh, we have, uh, of course, University of Malmo from Sweden, and we are going to meet uh, on the 24th of May in uh, Malmo. Um, uh, it's going to be a hybrid uh, event, uh, so again, you, you will be able to watch it online and uh, we are going to broadcast it. And of course, uh, uh, we will have um, audience in uh, Malmo uh, at the university. So uh, political capital is, of course, think tank. 
uh, like this Europa and we have also Alda. And uh, I will give a floor later to Alessandra to say a few words about uh, Alda. I think um, you um, are quite familiar with uh, this institution. It's a prominent uh, association of uh, local governments and local, uh, which is responsible especially for issues like local democracy, uh, democracy and, and things like that. They are, of course, based in France, but let's, I, I'm not going to steal the show uh, from uh, Alessandra and uh, uh, I will give, a, uh, give her floor in a few minutes. And of course, we have also um, Europa Nova, that's our partners from France. Again, that's a foundation, also a little bit think tank and so on. And uh, generally, uh, we are, as uh, Rudolf has already said, uh, uh, we are organizing events. The first one uh, took place in Trieste and was organized by ALDA. And uh, within the framework of our events, uh, we uh, 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 hold uh, public debates. And at the same time, we also uh, organize uh, workshops with uh, uh, citizens. Uh, in order to uh, have some kind of brainstorming and collect some ideas, uh, uh, gather people in order to discuss, debate uh, uh, the most important issues and prepare some recommendations. Uh, as uh, Rudolf has already said, the, the final um, uh, outcome of our project, uh, uh, it is going to be a sort of a declaration. Uh, we, uh, which is going to be addressed to uh, political political decision makers, NGOs, experts, and so on. And uh, uh, right now, let me check. Maybe I will be able to show the web page. Just a second. But maybe uh, um, for that, uh, just maybe it's a. Uh... If it's yeah. if your colleague is not ready, maybe Alessandra could in yeah, the meantime say a few please. words and introduce yeah, her organization yeah. and maybe say a few words that about please. the event in Trieste. Thank you. Thank you, Rudolf and Adam. So I will show my screen in a moment. I think you have to give me permission. Okay. Okay. So um, good morning, everybody. It's really nice to be with you today. So ALDA is the European Association for Local Democracy. It's a French registered NGO. And as Adam was already saying, is uh, the main focus is facilitating the cooperation between local authorities and civil society organizations and citizens. So we started in, I would be, quick, don't worry, wouldn't be the old story of ALDA, but we started in uh, 94 uh, when uh, actually the Council of Europe founded the local uh, democracy agency in the Balkan region. And then in um, 1999, actually uh, ALDA was established as a, you know, an umbrella organization for this uh, local democracy authority. And uh, in 2020, we actually celebrated 20 years of the organization. Um, so today we have five offices in Europe, one in Vicenza, one in Strasbourg, one in Brussels, one in Moldova, and one in Skopje, and also another one, sorry, in uh, Tunisia. Uh, we have 15 local um, authority, democracy authority that, uh, you know, work under our umbrella. Uh, we are a members organization, so we have more than 350 members and we have a lot of partners and in these 20 years we managed uh, we have been part of more than 250 projects and um, so you can see here uh, all our you know offices and uh, the agency we work with them and this is our structure we have a governing board an advisory board and of course the ambassadors and uh, so has uh, we were saying the, the focus is to promote local governance and citizen participation at the local level. And um, sorry, sorry, okay. So of course, our main goals is to work towards um, uh, sustainability, uh, um, more employment, gender equality, and also fighting Euroscepticism. We have several projects that have this focus and one is Euroscepticism. 
Okay. And of course, uh, within our, our network, we try to collaborate with each other, with all the you know, members and to share especially good practices. And you can see we are also part of different ne networks as Concord, um, of course, Council of Europe uh, and, uh, and others. So as uh, was already mentioned, uh, on the 5th of March, we held in Trieste the event Euroscepticism at the Gates of Europe, and it has a focus on migration and of the Balkan region. Uh, we had the presentation of the project. Uh, the first part was a round table with the presentation of the project, with the presentation of the project partners. We also had, you know, um, uh, talks from Antonella Valmarvida, which is the Secretary General of ALNA, and from um, uh, other experts from the, the Balkans, like Emir Korik, uh, Natasa Vukovic, and uh, we also had the advisor of the Central European Initiative Executive, and we had Pro Professor Altin uh, of Cultural Anthropology, that she actually explained us a little bit uh, the situation of Euroscepticism and migration at the Italian border as she is working in uh, Trieste, uh, where the uh, event was held. And then in the afternoon, we actually held the workshop, the cities, ooh, sorry, the citizen workshop uh, that, that focused on migration, refugee flows, and the European laws. So we had, you know, uh, we divided people in groups and we had different discussions with the idea to, uh, of writing a final manifesto. And at the end of the workshop, we had a presentation of different groups and a debate. And then um, so we had, you know, a collection of good practices and recommendations for the citizen manifesto. Um, so um, this is our, was our contribution. Um, has a part of you know these international events, and so I think uh, that's it. So I give the floor back to to Adam, and thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, uh, I'm very thank you, uh, really, Alessandra, for your input. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, I'm very sorry for this small inconvenience regarding uh, uh, technicalities, but nevertheless. Uh, I have just learned that uh, we can show our uh, web page, uh, the observatory tool. So please, if uh, uh, someone uh, can uh, uh, share the screen with you, and I will tell you a little bit about uh, our web page, the idea standing behind it. And uh, so please, can uh, someone help me? Okay. So generally, here you can see that what we have already done, we have, of course, designed, established the web page. Uh, we have uh, also uh, uh, uploaded uh, the content. Right now, we are mostly working on uh, uh, updating it and, of course, on proofreading. And uh, it's really uh, to use uh, this. Um, uh, uh, verses of famous Swedish uh, song, The Final Countdown from Europe, of course. So we are pretty soon to officially launch the web page. The idea is that uh, besides uh, all debates, uh, workshops and so on, uh, our manifesto, we would like to leave as uh, the final product uh, uh, the web page, which is going to uh, be a uh, tool for anyone interested in Euroskeptic political forces in Europe, and which will be, of course, uh, 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 very much uh, friendly to um, uh, internet users, not very complicated. And uh, of course, the content is going to be uh, is written in a uh, uh, not very scientific uh, uh, language, expert uh, oriented language. The idea is that we are presenting main uh, Eurosceptic uh, political parties in the EU countries. You can compare them. That's the idea that you have this tool that you can compare them, choose the party and learn something about uh, if someone can show a part that you have, for instance, uh, uh, logo and history of the party, uh, the main uh, uh, leaders, uh, bio the biographies, uh, 
uh, uh, results of elections, national elections, European elections, uh, um, and also uh, what are these case strongholds, the uh, top priorities of the parties. Of course, there is always some overlapping, but uh, we uh, did our best to find some speciality de la maison that we have certain uh, um, uh, peculiarities regarding uh, um, different countries, uh, specificities. So that was the idea to show them. Also, um, I think that's the advantage that uh, besides that, uh, you can learn something about uh, their attitude towards uh, the EU as such. We are presenting a wide scope of political parties from hearts. Uh, uh, Eurosceptics who generally they reject the idea of the European uh, integration. They would like to dissolve the European um, uh, Union and to, to uh, soft Eurosceptic political forces that prefer, in fact, to have some kind of uh, reform. Of course, we will see if the EU will uh, uh, survive this kind of reform of the European Union. And it means, in fact, that. Uh, reversal of the internal European uh, integration. So we are presenting these ideas, describing them, providing you with some uh, quotes from them and so on. And of course, uh, also uh, that's, I think, uh, of course, in my humble opinion, because it's very difficult to be uh, judged in your own case. Uh, we are going to talk about the uh, rule of law today. So definitely, I think another advantage is that we are uh, also uh, presenting uh, their relations with other uh, Eurosceptic forces. Uh, it is very important uh, these days because, as you know, we have this uh, uh, reshuffle, rearrangement of, uh, which is even, I would say, uh, um, which is taking place on an unprecedented scale uh, of the political scene regarding the Eurosceptic forces, especially uh, soft Eurosceptic political forces, these meetings that uh, uh, um, I, I can mention, these meetings that uh, have already taken place in Warsaw, in Madrid, and also, for example, uh, a common uh, declaration uh, uh, issued uh, uh, last year in July. Of course, we have many problems with them, be the Fides versus uh, the law and justice regarding the war in Ukraine, the Russian aggression against Ukraine. So definitely the situation is very dynamic and changing. And uh, of course, uh, we are we will try also to show uh, these changes because we are going to release regularly some uh, reports uh, which are going to be dedicated to the most important issues, topics, and also sometimes events uh, regarding the relations between uh, these uh, 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 Eurosceptic political forces. So definitely, I think it can be very useful uh, argument, uh, uh, instrument. I'm sorry, uh, tool. Uh, uh, this web page uh, also for uh, uh, because it's going to be open to anyone. Uh, you can enter, surf uh, on this web page, pick up some interesting uh, things for you, and it can serve also as an educational uh, educational tool for um, also for um, some uh, scholars, uh, for the students and so on. Uh, uh, so uh, definitely uh, that's uh, the idea, uh, main idea standing behind our project and this webpage that it's, it is Europe for citizens. So we would like to uh, uh, increase knowledge and awareness of political processes taking place in uh, the European Union, because in my humble opinion, in the long term perspective, probably one of the most important uh, challenges uh, to the European integration, in fact, uh, um, uh, represents this atten uh, represent these attempts of uh, far right uh, uh, political forces, soft Eurosceptic political forces to unite uh, to um, this unification efforts to create some kind of alternative to, towards the current uh, state of the European Union. And I, maybe I will stop here, of course. Uh, um, uh, you can, uh, if you have uh, uh, some questions, uh, don't hesitate to, uh, uh, I'm uh, right now approaching our audience, uh, don't hesitate to contact us. You can find our coordinates, uh, uh, our email addresses uh, in inter or internet, or even right now during, the, maybe we'll have a short Q&A section. To, so, of course, I'm uh, at your disposal, at your service. And right now, uh, again, I'm giving back the floor to 
uh, Rudolf, and we will have a, a, a public debate with uh, prominent uh, Hungarian experts. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction of the website. I think it's, it's turned out great, and I think it's really helpful in the way forward, and I can't wait to, to check it out myself when it's up, up to the public. Um, I, am, I was wondering if in the, in the attendees there are any questions regarding our, um, regarding the website or the project, maybe, or, or the past events. We are happy to um, um, say a few words about them if there are any questions. Okay, um, then um, Anders, since you are here, yes, um, if you want to say a couple of words, you are, of course, welcome to. No, I actually have a question for yeah, sure. to uh, actually, because I'm, uh, since we are not uh, physically, but digitally in Budapest, I'm really excited because I want to hear about the relationship between Fidesz and Jobbik, right? Because a decade ago, Jobbik was like, ooh, that was the extreme. You, the, oh, the, they were the extreme, right? But now, when you uh, considering what is happening today, you have like, oh no, it's EU versus uh, Fidesz all the time, right? It's, it's EU. Uh, so I, I was just uh, interested in what is the current situation, what is it right now, how does it, uh, yeah, would you say that is the, uh, who is the most Eurosceptic part, is it Fidesz or Jobbik, yeah. I, I think, um, I think we will uh, cover this topic in the, but I, I have wrote wrote up this question we will uh, cover this topic in the in the panel discussion i think with with experts who are more qualified than me to answer this question of course i have an opinion about that um but um but i think if if there are no uh, question closely regarding the the organization of the of the yeah. events and sorry. the Sorry, and uh, sorry. you yeah. you have you will have a uh, time for for this yeah, kind yeah. of okay, professional okay. type sorry. of questions, but we have yeah, prominent yeah. experts to to answer this. Yeah. So yeah. I would continue with yeah. them, yeah. and and I would like to in um, well yes. change change the um, event to the panel discussion at this moment, and I would like to of course um, introduce our panelists today, um, Eva Bordesch. He, she is um, she is the director of Demnet, and she was our partner actually in organization of the of the citizens workshop of Haeva. Uh, Hi. And um, we also have uh, Marta Pardavi, who is a who is a, or who is a director, I think, co-director of uh, Helsinki Committee in Hungary or the Hungarian Helsinki Committee. I don't know if you are here with us, Marta. Yes, I am. Hello. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation okay. to join this discussion. Thank you. And um, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Daniel Hagedisch, who is, um, who is an, a fellow at the German Marshall Fund. Um, and he is, um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's a fellow at the German Marshall Fund. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you very much. So, um, first of all, um, uh, I would like to ask um, Eva to tell us a bit about our event yesterday, and let's start with that. What were the what were the experiences um, um, from the event yesterday? How how does um, how does Edu skepticism evolved in the citizenry and um, Maybe you could tell us about their, the citizens' view about and how this event went, went, um, went out, basically, went down, basically. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Rudolf. Um, and thanks for having me. And it was a really nice uh, um, 
um, uh, to, to have this uh, this uh, workshop together um, yesterday. And uh, so in uh, just the next couple of uh, minutes, uh, I'm summarizing uh, what participants uh, uh, said uh, yesterday and uh, also what uh, we as Damnat captured um, throughout a series of events uh, we conducted here in Hungary as part of the conference and the EU process. And uh, we need to emphasize, of course, that uh, that uh, these discussions uh, um, cannot be considered as a representative uh, uh, thing, or you know, uh, they're just uh, they're just uh, uh, informal discussions with uh, with people um, who show up uh, uh, at such events uh, normally a, a lot more pro. EU than the average citizens, uh, I must say. But still, there are uh, there have been some really um, good and interesting thoughts um, uh, put forward, and I think that uh, that some of the discussions actually grasp um, very well what people uh, feel, uh, what people think, and how people feel towards the EU. And just a couple of main points. So participants yesterday emphasized that they believe that the EU, uh, EU skepticism or mm, disillusionment uh, can be linked uh, to the unrealized expectations uh, people had in the, in the 90s, 1990s regarding the changes uh, an EU membership would result in. Uh, because the EU was identified with a, a higher uh, standard of living. Um, so people expected that that by simply joining the EU uh, would uh, actually improve their living standards uh, vastly, uh, which it did not. Um, so uh, there is a, a disappointment uh, with regard to, to that. Uh, um, and uh, what, or what could it be, what we could also feel uh, during these discussions um, is that people actually would want a social EU. So they want the EU uh, to be a kind of a safety net uh, for them. And many pointed out the, the need for uh, a more coordinated health and, uh, and educational policies. And some even said that they would like for there to be a joint uh, uh, pension system or a VAT system in connection, especially in connection to, to foods and, uh, and transportation. Uh, and they also raised the question uh, what the EU is uh, after all or eventually. Uh, is it just a collection of economic interests or does it have uh, people's interests uh, at heart? Um, and, and they said that the EU uh, should decide whether it is purely an economic uh, oriented um, institution or creature or whether it also has values. So. Um, does the EU put uh, uh, people over profit or not? Um, and uh, with this regard, they, they feel that uh, the EU and EU policies uh, are, often to, are often not consistent um, and that, that creates some kind of a, a palpable tension. And, uh, and uh, they feel that their interests are that a, basically downplayed in comparison to, to potential economic uh, uh, gain. And uh, I just sort just looking at my notes here. And, um, and yeah, the, another important point was that, um, that uh, they say that uh, um, uh, while uh, the benefits of the EU are present at all levels of society, uh, it is still not something that is apparent to many people, uh, especially, or question mark, is it because uh, of the poor PR of the EU? Uh, is it just enough uh, to put uh, out a huge placard saying that uh, this or that was uh, renewed or built thanks to EU funding? Um, because they feel that it isn't, um, uh, especially not when some governments ride the victory for these developments, uh, um, you know, either by not voicing uh, how um, it was funded or claiming that uh, the real achievement, in fact, uh, is how uh, uh, the, the funding was secured. So uh, people feel that there is a huge gap between uh, them and the EU and the EU institution, and that needs to be addressed uh, um, somehow. Um, but also here, an, another interesting question um, 
comes up because uh, we all know that uh, democracy in Hungary and in um, Central and Eastern Europe is still um, in its infancy. So people don't even know how local municipalities work. Um, and they don't know uh, who is charged uh, uh, in what, uh, you know, when it comes to their own environment. Um, so how can we uh, expect people to know uh, and understand how the EU works and what the EU does for them if they um, do not even have um, a connection uh, with their own municipality? Um, so this community feeling is lacking. Um, and. Um, and uh, the, the, the issue is, you know, how we can, can address this. And many people voiced that uh, participatory democracy and, uh, and, uh, and strengthening uh, uh, local communities uh, in being able to take part in um, decision-making uh, could actually be the answer. But participatory democracy is still rather weak uh, in Hungary, you know, as well as in, uh, in the EU. Um, so, um, so, so this is how we, we actually could, could, could address this. Um, and, um, and the conclusion uh, of the participants uh, was that we have to return uh, to building uh, a democracy at the grassroots level. And the EU should support um, um, these, uh, these processes. And uh, they also pointed out that the conference uh, on the future of uh, Europe uh, is actually a good starting point or was actually a good starting point and that was a vital step uh, to this direction and um, mm, yeah um, basically I think that is uh, that is it okay thank thank you very much uh, for your short presentation and um, if uh, Marta or maybe Daniel have a have a question regarding your event, feel free to ask. Um, if not, I would turn to the questions. Yeah, sure, Marta, please. So thank you very much, Eva. It was, I think, a really good initiative to to organize this discussion. And one of my colleagues attended, and she said that it was a really interesting methodology too. And the, the feedback that you just uh, gave about uh, what people express there is, I think, really interesting. And it, it uh, resonates so well with other um, similar studies and, and, and field experiences about how Hungarians relate to these issues. I just have a couple of questions in that you mentioned the, the, the conference in the future of Europe, and uh, which just closed, right? And, and I think you follow this. So is there any differences that you see between the sort of general findings from the citizens panels that uh, these are, uh, compared to what these Hungarian um, citizens said yesterday? So that's my first question. The other is that do you think they had, um, did they have a, um, um, a sort of a, a good understanding in the group of the European Union's, not the institutional framework necessarily, but just what the EU is about. So when, when you say there is an expression of support and a desire for the social EU project, um, health and education policy in this, um, what was, how, how did they frame this? So in contrast to what we have now, or why is the EU not doing more? And did they reflect on the, on the fact that there is very little right now and that this would also entail a further close integration in fields that are um, that are, are would be very you know novel many citizens would like it but many governments particularly the Hungarian I think is not very supportive of this so how do they overcome maybe their their political mindset as Hungarians when they translate themselves into or transform themselves into a European system mindset. Is there a clash? Is this a natural progression? I wonder if you have any impressions about that and I would appreciate, thank you. Right, uh, so um, first of all, I think that, uh, that participants and, uh, and this was our general feeling um, um, throughout uh, this series of events that I, I mentioned, 
participants uh, actually appreciate uh, when they're uh, heard and, and, and listened to. And, um, and, um, and, uh, and these participatory processes so far actually have shown that uh, when people are given the opportunity and the chance uh, you know, to contribute um, um, to, to EU policies or, or decision making or input into decision making, uh, then, uh, then they're capable uh, of, of doing that. So, uh, um, so the, the, the suggestions they, they, uh, they make are much more well grounded uh, and uh, much more um, realistic uh, than many might have expected uh, uh, they, they would be. And, um, and, um, and I think that, uh, that, that the EU should support uh, uh, these, uh, um, these processes. And of course, it's very, I mean, it, it takes time um, for, for these processes to, to, to function um, fully, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but they are very, very much uh, uh, needed. And um, as for the mindset, yeah, I mean, of course, there is a clash, uh, but uh, just, just need to, to, to work on that. Okay, thank you. If there are no other questions regarding our, our uh, citizens' workshop, I would turn to our experts with some questions. Um, first of all, let's start with the, the question of Anders, and, and, and please tell us a little bit about the situation of uh, Fidesz vis-a-vis Jobbik on the Euroscepticism um, scene, and how Jobbik changed in the recent years, if it's changed uh, even a little bit. So please, uh, Marta, could you start with some insights about this? Well, I'll pass this. Um, I don't know if Donnie wants to address this, but this is certainly not something that I would want to address as a human rights activist. I'm not a political analyst and I'm not proficient. I'm happy to contribute maybe later on. Thank you. Okay, Daniel, maybe? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in. Uh, of course, I think that was a highly relevant question over the past 12 years. So practically since in 2010, uh, Jobbik came into the Hungarian parliament and it, with its very Eurosceptic and, and really radical right agenda also deeply influenced uh, the, the main political strategy of, uh, of the incumbent party Fidesz that time. It was highly relevant uh, after 2015, but mainly 2018, when when Jobbik started this this mainstreaming process, which practically led to the fact that the two parties changed position on the Hungarian party system, Fidesz became uh, practically uh, a full-blooded Eurosceptic radical right party. Meanwhile, of course, it's it's a difficult moral question also, and also of course also a professional and political question to to answer how genuine the mainstreaming of Jobbik really was. So for example, I'm always struggling, that's very personal, but always struggling how to label the party as a former radical right party or, uh, or actually as a, as a radical right party. But I think this question is not relevant anymore. For, uh, for the reason that what we have seen on the 3rd of April is that whatever the position of, uh, of the Jobbik party elite is with regard uh, to, to Europe. And if we are speaking, for example, with foreign and EU policy expert of the party, I think they, they will complete the homework and, uh, and accomplish it with, uh, very successfully. They will speak as they would be the representatives of, uh, of a, a center-right mainstream party practically echoing messages very similar to the European People's Party. But their former electorate is not sharing this approach. And that became obvious on the 3rd of April when a large part of the former Jobbik electorate simply deserted the party and, uh, yeah. and changed to, to the new really full blood, I wouldn't even say radical right, but, uh, but really extreme right party or homeland which is now represented in, uh, in the Hungarian parliament. I think that's the second time uh, in history of, uh, of the European Union uh, after, uh, uh, after Slovakia. 
that the, that the party really so close to the to the extremities is part of a national a national parliament, uh, and they are of course hardcore Eurosceptics, even if that it's it's not fully compatible with the academic and scholarly definition of of hard Euroscepticism, mm -hmm. which is that the parties are arguing for an exit from the European mm -hmm. Union. I think it's not necessarily a defining category anymore in the European Union because very few political parties argue uh, for for leaving the integration. Yeah. But it's it's obvious that the 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 future or the political strategy what they uh, what they represent with regard to the future development of the European Union that is an extreme right and and deeply Eurosceptical agenda which would definitely hollow out the value base and the existing framework of the European Union, even if these member states potentially uh, represented by such parties uh, would remain in the integration. So in, in very much in nutshell, my main point is that it's not a relevant question anymore because the role of Jobbik so fundamentally changed in, uh, in the European political yeah. scene that uh, it's it's even questionable uh, whether the party in a given form, I think, has a place or, or has a future in the Hungarian party system. Thank you. Great. Okay. So uh, regarding regarding Fidesz, what is Fidesz's position as an Eurosceptic party in European politics right now? Marta, maybe, or Daniel? All I can give is my interpretation. Obviously, it will not be authentic because Fidesz would and does speak for itself quite clearly. The way I see it, and taking the thoughts that Dani um, so well described um, in his remarks, taking those further, I think the debate in Hungary is, um, and and certainly enforced by Fidesz, is not about leaving the European Union um, or until. The last few weeks, I think this was really not on the agenda, on the horizon, but it's very clearly having a different European Union. And here it's very clearly palpable in, in, in messaging and in policy positions and even in legislation how um, the Hungarian uh, prime minister um, and, and his party would desire a completely different European Union. One where, and this is not, of course, their own position. They're, they're not the only ones with this position in uh, the EU um, among important political uh, forces. But I think it's very clear the EU is great as long as member states rule. And any sort of expansion of the European Union's current competencies is something that they will, by default, resist. Um, so this goes back to the to the issue, for example, about the health and education policies, clearly super sensitive um, and, and potentially very divisive, but goes, of course, much beyond these social, um, social policies. So I think what the Hungarian government has been um, saying and, and doing is ensuring that EU integration and cooperation would not really go beyond where it is now, and the reversal is something that they desire. And um, when it comes to the questions that citizens asked, uh, apparently in this discussion yesterday about the identity of the European Union, is it people over profit? Or is it profit over people? In my view, and that's my personal assessment, there's a clear answer to this. What um, the Hungarian government's position is probably to this question is that when it comes to the European Union and its institutions, it's certainly profit over people and funds over values. And whether their answer is different in the Hungarian context is, is, a, is, is, is another very intriguing discussion. And in this sense, I do sense that there is maybe um, uh, a difference between Hungarian public sentiment um, and the political sentiment in the government. 
but there's not really space. And I think we will always come back to this issue. There's no space to discuss this. So the all the more important to have the kind of discussions that happened yesterday. There's no space to discuss these political issues because basically anything political in Hungary has become very toxic and people want to stay away from it. And also there is no real plural media to speak of where which could convey these different kinds of views. So if you have fragmented, polarized audiences, the messaging will also be very polarized and there'll be little um, in terms of, of, of space to fill this gap. And um, just to go on this further, so I think the, the, the issue here for the European Union is a really severe one and the war in Ukraine has really brought this issue forward and exposes it and makes it absolutely imminent to, to address it. And I remember how much we heard about a Europe that protects. You all remember this, um, this, this motto, right? And I think citizens really expect this, uh, even more so today. Protection in terms of our social and safety net, in terms of our rights, um, in terms of our freedoms, and also in terms of our physical security against security threats. And whether, um, whether this is more than a motto is really a question when you have limitations on the EU's competence, when you have messaging that really, at least in Hungary, um, undermines the, the idea that Europe can protect. And what we hear as citizens, I think the propaganda media is that Europe cannot protect you. Europe is weak. If you look at the Hungarian Justice Minister's Twitter feed, she will make sure to point out the weakness of Europe, the, the inabilities of the European Union to deliver for its citizens. Of course, these inabilities partly stem from the, the institutional and legal framework, which the Hungarian government is very keen on maintaining and dismantling so that there wouldn't be more opportunities to give more protection. But anyway, the, the juxtaposition of, of weakness and inability versus the desire by citizens to have more protection is something that is, is clearly, I think, at the source, at the at the source or the roots of this Europe skeptic sentiment that is being really fueled by the Hungarian government. And I think this is also something to look at when you have government-funded propaganda from an EU member state government undermining the European Union. We've seen this before, and I wonder what good will that you know bring to to Hungarian citizens who are certainly feeling all sorts of insecurity today. Daniel, yes, uh, thank you so much. I just would like to chime in from a from a rather different perspective because I think Marta really perfectly covered this this substantial and and ideological approach of the party. Uh, to the European Union, and I think uh, it would be also interesting to to hear uh, uh, the opinion of Adam, who is one of the best non-Hungarian experts of, of Hungarian illiberalism and and Fidesz, and and how uh, the, the the recent uh, um, politics of the Hungarian governing party is is perceived from a Polish perspective. But what I uh, would like to add, it's really the position of uh, of Fidesz at the European political landscape. From a realist power perspective and and i think here during the past couple of weeks we we could really see deep and substantial shifts because at least until uh, the 24th of february i think uh, the strategy of the hungarian governing party was rather janus faced uh, on the one hand uh, they represented a, a free rider approach to the european union how the regime and partially also Hungary can benefit from the European integration without constructively contributing to it. And, uh, and part of this free rider strategy was, was also what I was, I think, put perfectly into words uh, in, in the latest Kosciut Radio interview by Prime Minister Orban that, that Hungary is the spike under the nail uh, of the European Union. And, uh, and the second phase was that Orban try to brand himself uh, as part of a, of a, a bigger movement, as, uh, as a genuine leader and representative of, on the one hand, Central European interest in the European Union, and on the other hand, interest of a conservative and, and Christian Europe. And of course, with this 
two attempts, he both expropriated and abused the term of Central Europe, very often the Visegrad cooperation, and, and definitely abused the term of, of Christian Europe. And since the 24th of February, I think Hungary, and especially Fidesz, is, is nothing else, just a spike under the nail of the European Union. Because Orban has to completely abandon his, his leadership ambitions, at least even temporarily, because nearly all of his strategic partners abandoned him due to, due to his government's position uh, in the current uh, uh, Russian war of aggression. It's the most obvious uh, in, in the Polish-Hungarian bilateral relations, but, uh, but we will also be able to see a, a similar cooling down within the V4 in general, in the Slovenian-Hungarian bilateral relations, and in some respect also with, with other radical right partners. Who, who are not necessarily wholeheartedly made an anti-Russian shift, but they, that they saw that it's necessarily due to domestic concerns. That's especially the case in, in Italy. So I think it's, it's somehow commonplace to say that, uh, that Prime Minister Orban is isolated because that's repeated approximately since a decade uh, in the Hungarian public narrative. But but now I think temporarily he's he's really isolated and represents a sort of really destructive Euroscepticism, which is actually not shared uh, by by many of his traditional Eurosceptic uh, partners, and definitely not shared by his most strategic former partners, which was the Law and Justice Party of, of Poland. Thank you. Adam, if you want to join in, you are free to do so, of course. Sorry, I muted myself. Uh, of course, Daniel, thank you very much for your compliment. Uh, I have one very huge disadvantage. I don't speak Hungarian, and uh, of course, I'm trying to follow news, uh, and uh, probably I'm much more familiar with uh, the Hungarian political scene than most. Uh, uh, Europeans, uh, but nevertheless, my knowledge is based on my contacts also with Hungarian experts, that, uh, including you, that uh, I appreciate very much your knowledge. And uh, my reading of uh, relations between the law and justice and uh, Fides and also Fides position in the European Union is maybe a little bit uh, slightly different. Uh, and I'm not going to say something very provocative in order to uh, steer some kind of discussion. But nevertheless, uh, what I'm seeing right now that definitely uh, we have uh, the most serious, we are experiencing right now, the most serious crisis in military relations between Fidesz and the law and justice. And uh, uh, in fact, before uh, the parliamentary elections in Hungary, uh, uh, peace, uh, the law and justice, uh, was in fact very reluctant to criticize Orban. They were pressed by the opposition that uh, they should do that, but they would prefer, for example, to attack France. And in the case of France, again, uh, that was quite interesting that during the electoral campaign before the presidential elections, uh, they focused mostly on Macron. And they avoided, refrained from uh, criticizing uh, Le Pen. And again, they were attacked by the opposition in Poland. That, uh, in fact, according to our opposition, and they are right, uh, you can't compare uh, Le Pen and Macron regarding the so called pro Russian stance. And the situation changed after the elections in uh, Hungary, especially, I think, uh, in my opinion, some Rubicon. Uh, and um, some kind of game changer watershed for uh, the law and justice was uh, this press conference of uh, Prime Minister of Hungary. Uh, and just give me a chance to quote, I have here uh, this quote. So he said about a uh, uh, massacre in Bucha committed by Russians, we live in an area of massive manipulation where we can be sure if we can trust our own eyes. So after that, I think that was over for peace, too much really. And uh, Kaczynski reacted and threatened Orban in fact publicly, publicly in the interview that we, 
with this uh, with the continuation of these kind of statements and the uh, policy foreign policy um, he should uh, prepare himself even for uh, the breakup of relations between peace and fides and he said something like that when prime minister oban says that he does not see exactly what happened in bucha he must be advised to go to an eye doctor so i probably that uh, that uh, that was uh, right now in my opinion the continuation of course they maintain contact even uh, a few days ago deputy uh, uh, minister of foreign affairs of poland visited uh, budapest but still only deputy minister and it would be very uh, difficult to reconcile and to improve these relations we we doubt some substantial change of uh, rhetoric discourse on urban side and the test very, a very important test for, uh, uh, from the perspective of law and justice of Fidesz behavior is, of course, the issue of embargo on oil, on Russian oil. Yeah. So it's, it's very difficult right now situation for Orban. Nevertheless, I don't agree that he is completely isolated. In fact, uh, he, and it was very symbolic, uh, that was some kind of tradition that after the elections, he visited Poland and he met with Polish guys. That's, uh, Daniel is very right that definitely that, that uh, uh, party, I mean, uh, namely law and justice, uh, these guys were the best friends, definitely. And right now, his first visit was to Vatican and he met with uh, the Pope. Uh, you probably know something about, uh, you have, heard about interviews for for example Corriere della Sera and uh, what the uh, Pope uh, the Pope uh, has said things like that uh, that he learned something about Ukraine from Orban it's really bizarre a ridiculous event but nevertheless he met with the Pope and then he met with Salvini and uh, uh, also they organized together the meeting of MAPs from the European Parliament of Fides and Lega and of course, on the one hand, it means that, especially in countries, uh, we can give a floor later on to uh, Alessandra to share uh, with us her opinion. Nevertheless, in Italy, uh, there are some politicians and some parts of society which are not very consistent uh, regarding uh, the, Russia, uh, the Russian aggression against Ukraine. And you can find some people trying to, re let's put it that way, to. Uh, uh, relativize, uh, relativize a little bit uh, this issue to try to understand Russia and so on. Uh, um, for instance, according to the most uh, recent opinion polls conducted in uh, the European Union, among the biggest member states, you can find the largest minority in Italy of people who are in fact blaming uh, um, the NATO for uh, the war, not Russia. So. Definitely, uh, Orban is clever and he knows, okay, that's the country that I should focus on, namely Italy and Lega. But the problem is that Lega is going down with Salvini, Matteo, and uh, weakening. And uh, uh, Fratelli d'Italia, other guys, uh, 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 Miss Meloni, they are on the rise. Uh, that's the first party in the opinion polls. And uh, they are more, uh, they are definitely tougher in Russia. Than Lega. There are also some uh, guys like Hamlet, they're hesitating and so on. But nevertheless, in that case, uh, here uh, again, we have this uh, a wider picture and again of uh, let's call networking of uh, far right parties that uh, uh, Fides and Orban they have to take into account that. Uh, 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 Law and Justice and Kaczynski, they have their own friends in the Western Europe. Vox from Spain, these guys are on the rise. Uh, they have also uh, uh, Sweden Democrats, for instance, in the European Conservatives and Reformers from Sweden. Uh, we, uh, they have also Fratelli, Italia. They are closer to Fratelli than Fides is to uh, this part. And uh, that's why I think that uh, Orban uh, should think about it, it, uh, his own relationship with uh, uh, the law and justice, not only in a bilateral dimension, but also in multilateral dimension. All these ideas to um, uh, this uh, unification effort to rearrange the far right uh, uh, political scene without uh, extreme uh, far right, like uh, 
alternative to Deutschland or uh, Wilders, only soft zero skeptics. It's very difficult to achieve this goal without some kind of uh, right now reconciliation between Fidesz and uh, uh, law and justice. The only parties who, in fact, they rule uh, uh, EU member states. And of course, that's why they are quite important in this process. Uh, uh, so lack of cooperation, tensions between them, that's a huge challenge to this unification of worlds. And uh, last but not least, of course, uh, I think that uh, uh, probably for Orban, because um, he would like to join uh, this new uh, political club in a group in the European Parliament, established by some kind of merge between European conservatives and reformers. But here again, uh, we have uh, the problem that some guys will join and some guys will uh, probably will not be interested or reluctant to join, including Sweden Democrats that they didn't take part in these meetings in, War in Warsaw and Madrid, and then did this, uh, and they didn't subscribe, they didn't sign this um, uh, declaration issued by uh, radical right parties in July. And we have other parties from the European conservatives and the reformers, which are not interested in uh, pushing themselves too much to the right and to the Eurosceptic uh, uh, position. So it's going to be very tricky and complicated process, this unification. And probably uh, Orban is counting, OK, in the worst case scenario, I will join uh, the identity and democracy with uh, Matteo Salvini with Le Pen. OK, and Thanks. I will stop you. OK, thank you. Uh, Anders, you had a question or comment? Yeah, the thing is, uh, I would first say thanks a lot to Marta, Daniel, and also Adam. Actually, Adam, in your talk here, you actually covered, uh, you actually answered one of my questions, right? Because, yeah, I'm, my, my concern is actually what were all the implications of the attack on the 24th of February? And this is so very interesting because they, we can, uh, what we had before 24th of February, we had a close friendship between Hungary and uh, Poland, right? These are, you know, yeah, we are, you know, uh, a lot of things. But after the 24th of February, they take, have taken two complete opposite stands, right? Or, yeah. Of course, it could be much more nuanced, but you can say, if you generalize, you can say that. Uh, the, okay, when it comes to the Sweden Democrats and the immigration party in Sweden, you can say that that is super, also very interesting because if we go back to 2015, when it, these campaigns about the refugee welcome and so forth, the SD was totally against it right no 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 we should not have any refugees from syria what do they say now yeah ukrainians come here come to sweden you're welcome right so they have changed position completely they are no 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 from syria no 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 don't come here don't come sweden is full ukrainians oh we you might you are welcome right okay my uh, my question, actually, which I'm really would like to be enlightened about, is if after the invasion on the 24th of uh, February, there were presidential elections in both France and Hungary. And if you looked at the what were the uh, and uh, you could see that after the invasion, Macron's uh, figures, poll figures skyrocketed, right? And uh, and uh, it was and uh, obviously also also won, right? The a quite comfortable uh, victory against Marine Le Pen. But in Hungary, what what uh, were the implications for the poll figures? You know, what happened with the support from the Hungarian people for for? Uh, Orban, he actually stood against everyone, <laughs> all other parties. But the thing is, you you could go go to see the poll, and you see, you didn't see uh, 
a direct uh, uh, effect like of uh, like decreasing or raising or any kind of uh, uh, any particular strong uh, effects on the pole figures in Hungary. So my question is, why were there so strong effects on in the French presidential elections, but not in Hungary? I don't I don't have a full answer, but I mean, I just think it's very interesting, but uh, maybe you can maybe you know some you have some insights, which I don't. Yeah. OK, please. Thank you. Anyone who Adam? Have a... Just uh, very briefly uh, regarding this factor of the Russian aggression and the 24th of uh, February, that's very interesting that before uh, the Russian invasion, in fact, um, probably even uh, from November, uh, we uh, in fact observed this uh, deployment of Russian armed forces around Ukraine, increase this increase of the presence and so on. And uh, uh, a lot of, uh, we got a lot of warnings uh, from uh, especially the US, the US intelligence and so on, that uh, a fully fledged aggression is uh, really a, a very um, unfor unfortunately probable scenario. And what is very interesting uh, that in, uh, it uh, didn't have an impact on uh, peace uh, to, at that time, together with PIDES, uh, organized all these meetings in Warsaw and in Madrid with these guys, mostly pro-Russian, uh, far-right parties. And uh, uh, what, why it is uh, very important? Because it is showing that uh, there are some factors that in fact uh, uh, can uh, uh, influence uh, peace position and uh, uh, make it uh, uh, less, uh, con uh, I mean, pri uh, principle regarding uh, uh, peace and uh, making it uh, uh, more open to uh, cooperation with uh, these far-right parties, despite the fact that, uh, of course, um, they didn't change dramatically after 2040, in my opinion. They are not sincere. That's mostly artificial, superficial, this change. Oh, right now we can say, yeah, we are quite critical, some of them. Some of them, uh, they are not even able to do that. And they still, like Le Pen, uh, they are trying to um, present situation that of, yes, but, and the but is very huge, yeah? So what is this main factor? This, what uh, the, the topic of our discussion today, uh, of course, the main topic, the rule of law, the dismantling of rule of law. That's a very important part of party ideology in case of the law and justice and Fides at the same time. So that's why they need each other. They, they maybe don't like each other right now. They have been, um, there is a, some kind of, uh, um, in this marriage, we have uh, quarrels and uh, internal struggle, but nevertheless, they need each other uh, because they believe that uh, they have to cooperate in order to uh, defend themselves against the mainstream. And again, here, that's a paradox that probably this war even if we look at the most recent statements from Macron and other uh, politicians from so-called mainstream, um, uh, it can influence the future of the EU in such a way that we can observe the acceleration of uh, internal integration. And they don't like uh, this scenario very much, peace and uh, Fidesz. Together, they would like with other guys to stop, uh, uh, to prevent this scenario. And it's going to be very uh, interesting to watch these guys because they are some uh, pulling factors and pushing factors, uh, pulling out and pushing them together and pulling uh, them out because of uh, 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 especially the war in Ukraine and internal developments in the European Union. Daniel? Yes, thank you very briefly from a Hungarian perspective, but I think we are somehow deviating from the original topic. So if you would like to <laughs> to make a turn back uh, to, to the panel discussion question, I think I can also skip my contribution and uh, and we can continue uh, at a different point. 
No, no, please, please continue. Yes, uh, I, I, I somehow a bit, uh, bit disagree with, with the take of, of Anders because I think uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine and the war itself deeply influenced the Hungarian election campaign and, and provided a very significant push for the social and electoral support of the Hungarian governing party. And, and I think it has three main reasons, and I just very briefly sum, sum them up. The first one, it's, it's very obvious, it practically killed and neutralized the original topic of, uh, of the opposition, which, which used to be corruption, relationship to the European Union, somehow also the quality of democracy and rule of law in the country, rule of law in the country. These, these weren't primal topics anymore after the 24th of, of February. The second one, uh, and the third one, and uh, these are somehow intertwined with each other, I think Hungary is in some res respect really an outlier now in the Central and Eastern European region. And that is that Central Europe now practically from Estonia to Bulgaria is unified in a common threat perception related to Russia. And uh, the only country which is not sharing this threat perception, uh, and not only the government, but in some respect also the Hungarian society, is Hungary. Why? Because due to this very centralized, I would say propaganda, but it's a simplification, due to the domination of the Hungarian public discourse and, and media, uh, the this, this subversive messages of the Hungarian government were really effective in shaping the threat perception of the Hungarian society. For a large part of the Hungarians, which, which covers both the mainstream Peter's electorate and a significant part of the undecided voters, the main threat is not an aggressive Russia in the neighborhood, but how a war which is unrelated to their everyday life can influence energy prices. And the main, uh, the main goal is not to be somehow dragged in this conflict. As of Hungary wouldn't have shared responsibility with its, its neighbors, its partners, and wouldn't be threatened, for example, even directly or indirectly by a potential Russian victory in this war. And, uh, and through this lack of threat perception, of course, the, the political offer of, uh, of Fidesz in the election campaign became, became very attractive for a large part of the Hungarian electorate, which was this, this peace narrative that we are keeping equidistance from, uh, from the aggressor and its, its victim. It's practically not our business. Uh, what is important that, uh, that the, the basic needs of the Hungarian, uh, Hungarian society are met, may that be related to energy prices or, or in any other form, that was really a political offer to, to a population which, which was mentally shaped in the Kada regime. So we practically doesn't have anything to do with, with big politics. It's important that our everyday life really is unimpacted from, uh, from big or larger political developments. And that was the reason of this success. And to both of the second and the third uh, item, so the shaping of, uh, uh, of the threat perception and, and being able to, to frame a political offer uh, to, uh, to the expectations of the society was, I think, the media dominance uh, in Hungary really uh, crucial. And, and of course, it is very often dismissed as an argument that the political playing field is, is tilted because everyone is blaming uh, the opposition parties. And of course, in many respects, I think the campaign was far from being optimal to, to remain diplomatic. But you cannot compare the Hungarian situation with, with any other country, not even on the Western Balkan. Uh, because you don't have such a dominant, I would say, party state in any other countries of the European Union and its European neighborhood. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Marta mentioned this topic before, but can the actions of the EU institutions change the current state of rule of law in Hungary, or can it affect it in any way? Will the rule of law mechanism able to succeed in restoring rule of law in Hungary, or is it just a um, mirage of sorts? Marta, if you have if you have anything to add? Yes, of course. Um, well, this is a this is an intriguing topic, and there is no yes or no answer. 
but certainly I would reframe it um, a bit from this point of view of, of not actually restoring a, a rule of law in Hungary, but you know, this sort of skeptic uh, sentiment. So actually, are the EU institutions contributing to driving your skepticism or are they contributing to decreasing it? So what is the impact of these actions? And of course, this on the Hungarian citizens and their perception of what the European Union is doing or what it should be doing is very much impacted by this media dominance. So whenever you hear anything about Hungary, I think you have to take it with, with this additional um, factor uh, of, of, of not having plural media and how much this really not only undermines the, you know, the lofty ideals of democracy, but actually how people perceive their immediate surroundings and, and, and this, um, and, and, you know, going into a hospital, seeing that there was, uh, there's a big uh, billboard that says that there was millions of euros spent on its refurbishment and getting the kind of treatment that, um, in terms of the, the lack of high quality care, material, and also personnel, um, and the disconnect between this, how people get over this. Well, if you're spoon fed a narrative, about the weakness, the inability, the inadequacy of European Union institutions, then of course everything else will be looked at this, um, look through this um, this filter. Going back to this question, so are the EU actions, are the EU institutions contributing or or to to weakening um, your skeptic um, attitudes, or are they boosting it? Well, it's not so easy. The same way as the disillusionment that Eva mentioned um, from the from the from the discussions yesterday about the disillusionment about the, the political changes the, in the in the nineties and in the in the early two thousands around EU accession, I think there is a disillusionment among many people who would want EU institutions to take action. Um, they see the very often um, criticized, you know, complacency, slowness, um, hesitation, or as I say, reluctance of EU institutions as something that um, that is a sign of, of a weakness of the European Union. Even if they would want the EU to, to take action because they're outraged at what's happening in Hungary, these signs of inaction by the Commission particularly contribute to, to driving the disillusionment. So even the best allies are being, I think, sometimes uh, disillusioned. They would expect more action. And conversely, those who think the European Union really should just um, uh, leave this whole rule of law topic to buy into the narrative that um, that is um, actually very, very far from the truth presented by the Hungarian government very often when it comes to rule of law critiques. Um, they also see this um, this slowness, this this uh, this not even stop and go um, uh, dynamic of of the Commission as an instance of or or as, a, as an evidence of weakness. And so the question here is, how can the European institutions be actually stronger and proceed in a stronger way um, by Hungarian citizens, both by those who want them to act and also by those who think the undermining of the rule of law is just fine for us in Hungary. This is a big, big uh, dilemma. And when you um, have conversations um, with policymakers and decision makers in European Union institutions, they're also really unclear whether they should take action, whether they should call out um, the, the the developments, whether they should be publicly critical, or should it be you know the 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 sadly the dialogue versus the the action that we see now since February twenty four, um, I think pretty well unveiled for for the failures that it has created. This um, this is very much characteristic. So, in when I am when I'm asked this question um, by European um, Policymakers or those who have some influence, whether they should call out 
hungry for for the rule of law dismantling, or should they try to to have some sort of constructive dialogue with the Hungarian authorities, um, being aware of the potential media backlash um, that um, they might face in Hungary if they do have a strong public statement. I always encourage them to be strong um, because this is strong in public because you need to get across the Hungarian citizens showing weakness and hesitation is exactly the kind of, 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 um, of reaction that the Hungarian government can exploit to undermine the European Union, even if it is done with, um, with a carefully considered cautious approach that looks at the interests of other EU member states. So um, very often I think uh, the European institutions should look stronger um, on the values and on their actions, and this requires, of course, better, better um, dialogue with citizens. You need to have dialogue with citizens strengthened than than um, dialogue with autocrats. I think that's basically the the main message that we should have all learned by now, and this needs to be put into action. So, yes, yeah, citizen dialogues are one way to explain to people what the EU cannot do. And if you want the EU to do more when it comes to, for example, social Europe, democracy or action and the rule of law, well, you citizens can also have a say. And it's not only in the elections every four years. So I think there is a, there is a lot more the European Union can do. Um, we will also see, of course, how EU institutions such as the Council will, will take action and will respond to what has been going on since February 24 in Europe and specifically in Hungary, the issues that have been discussed by Adam and Daniel might play out um, in 10 days when there is a general affairs council looking at Hungary's underperformance on rule of law issues in the framework of the Article 7 procedure. So these are going to be, of course, sad, sadly not public indications of, of maybe uh, changes in, in um, again, back to this word threat perception. Um, Dani, you said that if Hungary's a thorn, a spike in the nail, right? Under the nail, that it's bothersome, but not really. Or that's not, it. Um, but I, I really think that um, in some fields, this might be true, but when it requires a uh, common position versus um, real threats and, and real enemies of peace in Europe today, this thorn is really blocking action. And so it also presents an opportunity to be, to be portraying the European Union as a weak structure, not only politically, but structurally, unable to act. Um, so the thinking about how to fortify the EU's cap capability today to take action um, together in, in a time of of emergency is really important. It's been underscored with regard to COVID too. And um, this is one of the big, big identity issues, I think. Um, and the Hungarian government is really not helpful in this regard with its position, uh, with its, with its um, general questioning of the value of a common European position in, in general. So, as a, as a, you know, as a closing um, um, remark on this question, I, all I would offer is that, yes, the tools are out there. They took so much time to, to be crafted. They have now um, been adopted. I'm thinking of the rule of law conditionality. It's, it's really imperative that in this uh, situation, Europe also stands strong with its values internally, not to look weak from, outside from, from the point of view of its own citizens who expect it to act. And so when it comes to not only Hungary, but also Poland and the dismantling of judicial independence in Poland, I think that um, uh, the voices of those who call for the commission to take serious action and not to you know, give in because we have a war going on. Don't give up on EU core values at a time when democracy is really threatened. How can we, how can we contribute to, to undermining our own democracy? This is really important to give a voice to this. And I think a lot of citizens do have this, this voice. Thank you. Daniel, do you have some closing remarks or um, 
or any addition to this topic or questions? Yes, uh, very briefly, a, a closing remark, uh, closely related to, to Martha's points, but I fully and completely share. Um, I'm a bit op optimistic in the regard that I think EU actions and EU measures can still shape the cost-benefit calculation of, of the Hungarian government, and they do. Uh, but very surprisingly, or, or at least partially surprisingly, the reaction of the Hungarian government is not necessarily what is, what is mostly expected. A couple of, of Hungarian and international experts also predicted that there will be a, a realignment with EU and, and Western partners after, after the election. I was one of the few who argued that there will be a, a peacock dance put on steroids, and I think that's what we see. Because uh, it was obvious that the, the suspension of the recovery fund, uh, the missing signature on, uh, on the cohesion policy framework agreement, uh, the triggering of the rule of law conditionality mechanism, it put a significant pressure on the Hungarian government because Hungary is deeply dependent on EU financial transfers. How have they reacted? Not with realignment, but practically with the chicken game. And we are now in a chicken game situation when, when, although this is not officially now tied to each other, but I think sooner or later the issue will be revealed. In, in this very famous May of Six uh, speech of Orban, there was also a quote that uh, the unblocking of the sex sanction package is impossible without, uh, without the settlement of the Hungarian issue at the EU level, which is, I think, a clear reference to, to all of these, these financial questions. So uh, the Hungarian government is practically signalizing that it can cause much higher political cost for the European Union than, than practically the, the fulfillment of the, of the Hungarian demons would be. So it's a, it's a chicken game. And if the European Union will step down, uh, then, then it will really fundamentally question the strategic quality uh, of the EU institutions and whether they are able to, to react on, on existential crisis uh, of the European Union. So I think the EU should also double down. And as Marty mentioned, the, the perfect frame for that would be the next General Affairs Council. I think the French presidency should put forward a voting motion on Article 7, Paragraph 1, which only requires a four-fifths majority. And, and significant messages should be sent to the Hungarian government that the suspension of the voting rights is within reach and is a possibility. Of course, there are hesitant partners and the key uh, player in this regard is, is Poland. And I completely share the, the analysis of, of Adam that this mutual defense pact between the two players is not dead yet. And, and, uh, and uh, a straightforward Hungarian veto of the six sanction package would be required to to kill that uh, uh, that cooperation but i think all of us should send uh, the message uh, to the polish government that peace doesn't only have one bodyguard in the european union but it has only at least it has at least 10 of them because under the given circumstances i think no central and eastern european and baltic country could seriously consider uh, article 7 sanctions against poland so the Polish and the Hungarian rule of law stories are now completely decoupled from each other. And, uh, and if Central European countries, which traditionally protected the Hungarian government, are now able to, to just uh, send the right signal that the European Union can, cannot be kidnapped in st such a strategic crisis, then, then I think that could really fundamentally shape the cost-benefit calculation of the Hungarian government as well. But, um, okay, that's my final phrase. One, I would like to make a meta research about uh, how many publications uh, used the phrase, now it's time to play hard hardball with the Hungarian government over the past 12 years. <laughs> and I think this is, this is still the single message what, what we can send to Brussels and, and Western players. Thank you. Thank you. I think we could continue these discussions for hours. I think it was really interesting, but unfortunately we have run out of time and uh, I would like to uh, end this discussion now. Maybe we will have some other opportunity to continue these discussions, um, especially at the other public events. But for today, I would like to thank you 
all for coming and especially our guests who have um, indulged us in in their in their valuable opinions and the remarks and um, yes thank you all for coming and thank you um, who have uh, watched us and followed this discussion thank you all. and uh...